Let us pray. Father, we pray that by your spirit, my mouth would be filled with your gospel so that by your spirit, our ears this morning would be filled with your gospel so that this morning, our lives would be more and more conformed to your gospel so that this, your world, because of what happens here this morning, would be more and more filled with your gospel people. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. It's World Mission Sunday. So where are all the missionaries? They're right here. I'm looking at them. You see, missionaries, and we know this. You know the secret of preaching. It's mostly what the people of God already know. They just forget. We all know this. I hope you know this. Missionaries are not a subset of Christianity. Missionaries are not the SEAL Team 6 of Christianity. Missionaries are not the supercharged, superhero, super gifted group of Christians. Missionaries are what every Christian is called to be. You see, the mission is God's. God is the one who's reconciling the world to himself through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. God is reconciling the world to himself. God is on mission. And he has, through that mission, grabbed a hold of us, and now we are on mission. He has put us on mission, not by our choice, but by his choice. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to bear fruit. Appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will abide, that will last. See, all of the church is on mission. Every Christian is a missionary. The problem is we are prone to forget. We forget that we are on mission. We forget that in every aspect of our lives, we are on mission. We are missionaries. And when we forget as the church, the results are disastrous for the world. One of my favorite movies growing up as a kid was The Muppets Take Manhattan. If you haven't seen it, there's probably something wrong with you. But The Muppets Take Manhattan, Kermit the Frog, Broadway actor, little troupe of Broadway actors, they're about to launch their big show on Broadway. And he gets hit on the head and gets amnesia. I know I'm giving away the whole thing, spoiler alert, but hey, if you haven't watched it by this point, it's your own fault. But he gets amnesia and he forgets who he is. He doesn't even remember his name. And he becomes this hardened advertising executive. And he's a total jerk. And the show, it looks like, is not going to go on. See, this story of Acts chapter 3, I'm going to come back to Muppets, don't worry. This story in Acts 3, some of you are like, what happens? I'll get there. This story in Acts chapter 3, if you turn there with me, as we continue our series through the book of Acts, this story in Acts chapter 3 is a reminder to the church of what it looks like to be Christians. To remember who we are. No matter where we are, what we're doing, who we're with, we're on mission. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And there was a man who was lame from birth being carried, who daily they laid at the entrance of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms of those coming to the temple. And as Peter and John were about to walk into the temple, the man asked them for alms. And Peter looked at him intently, and so did John. 
And Peter said, look at us. And the man fixed his gaze on them, hoping to receive something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I not, but what I have, I do give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then he took him by the right hand, raised him up. Immediately, his feet and his ankles became strong. He leapt up, stood, began walking around, entered into the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. And all the people in the temple saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the man who had been outside of the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had been done to him. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. See, this story from Acts chapter three is the story of humanity, really. This is a picture of humanity. Think of it this way. The man represents humanity without Christ. Lame, from birth, unable to move, outside of the temple of God. I love the description, the beautiful gate. What a juxtaposition. This beautiful Corinthian gate and this poor beggar who cannot come in. That's a picture of humanity. Asking for alms, saying, you know, just give me a little bit of something in my life so I can get through this let's be honest, relatively miserable life. Just give me enough to get through. And then all of a sudden, two Christians show up, give him more than he could ever dream to even ask for, healing, life. And he walks, and now he's in the temple, and he's with God. He asked for alms, but he got access to the living God. This is the picture of humanity and the church that meets humanity on mission. And it's all because it's mission accomplished. Why? Because Peter and John remembered who they were. He, they remembered that in every place, in every circumstance, with every person, they were on mission. As we look at Acts chapter 3 this morning on World Mission Sunday, let's be reminded who we are. First, we are Jesus' people. Mission takes place with Jesus' people. Not just on our own, it's a people. But not just Jesus' people, it's it's Jesus' people going in Jesus' power with his authority. And not even just that. Here's who we are. Jesus' people going in Jesus' power to be Jesus' presence in this world that needs Jesus. Do you hear that? To be Jesus' own presence to a world that needs Jesus. See, first we see that we are Jesus' people. Mission takes place with Jesus' people. Verse 1 Peter and John were going up to the temple. I love that we put Peter and John side by side here. They're both disciples. They're the people of God. They've been following Jesus. They're inner circle disciples. But they're totally different, aren't they? Like you think back to what you know of Peter and John. I don't think we could pick two disciples more different from each other. I mean, Peter's the doer and John, book of Revelation, John's the dreamer. Peter's the practical man. John is the poet. Peter is the man that denied Jesus at the crucifixion. John's the guy that actually stuck around so long that he could stand by the cross and be given responsibility for Jesus' own mother. Just such different disciples. And this difference in these disciples, I think, is is a comfort and a challenge. Here's the comfort. The comfort of the fact that There's multiple disciples here, Peter and John. You and I together is, we're not alone on this mission. We're not doing this on our own. This is not you and Jesus off by yourself. 
This is you and the people of God in mission, right? We are together. We're not alone. Luke chapter 10, verse two, Jesus sent them out two by two. Acts chapter 13, verse two, Saul and Barnabas sent out together. We see this picture of partners and companions all the way through the book of Acts. It's a little bit like the fellowship of the ring where Frodo says, I will take the ring to Mordor, but I do not know the way. And then everybody just gathers around and says, I'll lend you my sword and I'll go with you. And a fellowship is formed. We do mission together. We're not alone. But also, it's not just a comfort. It's a challenge because that will mean if we're not alone, that we're gonna have to partner with people who are different than us. I mean, anyone in the room who's married knows what it's like to partner with someone who's different than us. We're all different. And yet, it's not an incompatibility that comes from those differences. It's a complementarity. Is that a word? Complementary. We're complementing each other. You're with me. We're complementing each other. We have common faith as we go on mission together. But we have different styles. We have different emphases. We have different personalities. We have different gifts. Heaven forbid, we have different politics. But we're partners on mission. Partners together with different jobs, with different daily lives, with sub-vocations, appointments, different seasons of life we're in. And in all of it, as Colossians 1, 3 says, or Colossians 3, 17 says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. That's a picture of the church partnering together on mission. Very diverse people doing very diverse jobs, and yet the mission gets accomplished because we're doing it together. But we may annoy each other on a regular basis. I remember doing an Alpha course back in Ottawa a number of years ago. We were doing this Alpha course, this, you know, introduction to Christianity outreach. And we weren't doing the videos. We were actually giving the live talks. So I was giving the live talks and then there was a meal offered that, you know, people would eat and and connect with. And there was a small group experience. And by the end, you know, we had several people who had made commitments to Jesus for the first time. I remember talking to one of these guys, he came up to me and says, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm a Christian now. I was not a Christian when I started the course. You know, I want to get baptized. And I said, that's awesome. And I said, so what was it that kind of sealed the deal for you? And of course, if I'm honest, I was thinking he's going to say, well, you know, it was your talks. They're just, just, you know, it was amazing, like from heaven, manna. And um, he said, you know, the talks were okay. And I thought, And he said, and and, you know, the small group interaction, it was okay. He said, but you know what sealed the deal for me is there was this guy that came every night and I watched him set the tables and prepare the meal and serve the meal and clean up after us after the meal. And he said, I watched that man over 10 weeks. And I thought to myself, if there is a human being who will come out and serve a meal on a Wednesday night for 10 weeks in a row to a bunch of strangers, there must be a God in heaven. Peter says in verse four, look at us. Peter doesn't say, look at me. Look at us. Together, the church partnered on mission. But we're not just Jesus' people. Acts 3 reminds us that we're Jesus' people going in Jesus' power. I mean, how is it possible that Peter and John perform this mighty deed? A man who is lame from birth, 40 years old, we're told later in the story, his whole life. And those ankles, there's no muscle atrophy. He just can get up and start walking around. I mean, it's interesting, Luke, the physician, even in the description of the ankles, is using Greek medical words to describe this. How could Peter and John do this? This looks like the kind of miracle the Messiah would perform. In fact, it is a messianic miracle. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6, when the Messiah comes, the lame shall leap like deer. 
You wonder why Luke so many times says he's leaping, he's leaping, he's leaping. This is a messianic work. Well, how are Peter and John doing it? Because they're doing it in the name of Jesus, verse six. In the name of Jesus, I tell you, rise up and walk. That name has authority and power. And that's what Peter and John are calling upon. They remember that they go in his power, in his name, bearing his name. Verse 16, later in the story, when Peter's explaining this, will say, and Jesus' name, by faith in that name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. That's the name that we bear in mission. And when we forget the authority of this name, isn't it true that's a major obstacle in us being on mission, being courageous on mission? Because we so quickly get afraid of the situation and think, well, who am I? Sometimes that's true humility. Sometimes that's just an opportunity to be lazy. Oh, I, I, that's gonna be way too much work. It's the name of Jesus that he's placed on our lives. Book of Revelation says that name is written on our foreheads. We bear it in the world. His authority, his character, his power in this world. It's the name that Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And you know, I read that from Philippians 2, I think that makes sense. Like in heaven, of course, name of Jesus, the angels bow. I get that. On earth, Name of Jesus, all the people bow. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty profound. I mean, we're a pretty wicked bunch. But we all get on our knees. But under the earth, when Jesus' name is spoken, hell gets on its knees. That is the power of the name that we bear in this mission as we are in this world, lest we forget. Remember a friend of mine was studying university in Mexico. He was at the University of Guadalajara. And... Uh, he had his bike stolen. And this was a big deal because he had to get through the city. And so he went to the police station. And he said, my bike got stolen and I can identify the kid that took it. It was this 14-year-old kid. He said, I know who took it. And they brought a bunch of kids in in a lineup and he pointed out the kid. And instantly into the room walked this man with this very expensive suit. And he said, if you get your bike back, will you drop charges against that boy? And he said, Sure, the guy's just a kid. I just don't want my bike back. And so about five minutes later, the bike is brought into the room and the man in the suit hands him a card just with a name on it and says, if you ever need some help, use this card. And my friend thought, this is weird. He took his bike, went home, thought nothing of it. But a year later, he was at a checkpoint with all kinds of armed soldiers doing things they weren't supposed to do. And he was actually beginning to fear for his life. He searched through his wallet and found the card and just stuck it out the window. And he watched all the men back up from the vehicle and offered to wave him through. And he was bold enough to ask the leader of the militia, whose name is on that card? And they said, that is the chief, the general chief of police over this entire territory. Now, this is the story of the authority and the effective authority of a somewhat corrupt police chief. By the way, it was his son, the chief police son that had stolen the bike. A loving, corrupt police chief. (laughs) Can we begin to fathom, fathom the authority we bear as we have the name of the chief of the cosmos? On us. We got to remember who we are. Jesus' people in Jesus' power, being Jesus' presence to a world in need of Jesus. Being Jesus' presence. I love with the power of Jesus. I forgot to say 1 Thessalonians 1 5. Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and full conviction. But with that power, we come and we function as Jesus' presence in a world desperate for Jesus. 
Look at verse seven. I love this. It says that after Peter says, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk, that Peter reached out and took him by the right hand and raised him up. And at first you think, is Peter not trusting the power of the name? Does Peter think that he needs to help Jesus kind of get this guy off the ground? That's not what Peter's doing at all. Peter's doing healing in the same way that he watched his own master heal. Jesus had this tendency to speak the word and then grab them by the hand. Mark chapter one, Peter's own mother-in-law laying sick with a fever. Jesus spoke the word over, took her by the hand and lifted her up. Luke, Mark chapter five with Jairus' daughter who's died. Jesus says, time to get up, little girl, and then takes her by the hand and raises her up. Mark chapter nine, the boy with the unclean spirit who with seizures keeps throwing himself into the fire. Jesus speaks the word over those evil spirits, takes the boy by the hand and raises him up. What Peter is doing is modeling exactly or following exactly what Jesus had modeled. He said, well, this is the way that my rabbi did it. You speak the word and then you touch them by the hand. The man wanted a coin put in his hand. Peter put the hand of fellowship in his hand. Peter touched him. A man who has probably spent his entire life untouched, unclean. Peter reaches out and does what Jesus did to those who are in need touches them by the hand, takes them by the hand because Peter is now to be Jesus' hands and feet. What the Bible says or calls Jesus' body. So the Bible says a lot of things about who we are as Christians. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5 that we're ambassadors of Christ. But even more, we're told in 2 Corinthians 2, that we're the aroma of Christ, we're the fragrance of Christ in our world. But even more, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You are the body of Christ. Teresa of Avila 16th century mystic wrote this poem. She says, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the feet with which he goes out about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he now blesses. Now don't think for a minute that this somehow diminishes Christ. It doesn't diminish him at all. To say that the church is the body of Christ is biblical and it's amazing. Here's why. It means, where's Jesus right now? He's on the throne, thanks be to God. That as Revelation 5 tells us, when we look out in a world that seems in crazy chaos and wonder, where is this all going? There is one seated on the throne and it is the one who was crucified for us, rose again and ascended and has now been seated on the throne. And now is king over the cosmos where he sits eternally now. He sends out his spirit into his people and we become his body on earth. Jesus' ascension and enthronement doesn't mean some kind of absence of Jesus on earth. It means an increased presence of Jesus on earth because now his body is everywhere his church is. Do you hear it? We are called to remember that we are. This is what we are. We are the body of Christ. We're called to remember it. To not stand afar from a world in need. To not just pray from a distance. But to be his own hands and feet in all the places that need him. And there is no place on this planet that does not need him. As G. Campbell Morgan says, the church standing afar off and singing a song which she hopes will reach the dweller in the valley does but mock the need of the dweller of the valley. The church that comes down into the valley 
to the wounded, to the weary, to a woebegone world. This is the church through which Christ is doing his own work, through which Christ will win the ultimate victory. We are his body. Not because we've desired it or deserved it or done anything about it. We are his body because he desired it. He deserved it. And he did it. And it is a completed work. Think of it this way. You know when we say that when God looks at us, if we're in Christ, he sees Jesus? You, you, okay, Catechism 101, you know this. Like when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin if we're in Christ. He sees us as blameless because in the words of Jude chapter, verse 24, he has now made us able to be presented blameless before the Father because of his sacrifice. Second Corinthians 5, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. When the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, imputed, placed on us by grace alone. That's what the Father sees. So think of it this way. Jesus died so that when the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus, but he died for even more than that. Jesus died for you and me so that then when the world looks at you and me, they will see what the Father sees. Jesus. Because he's made us his body. And the result of the church remembering that we are the body of Christ is we will find human beings who have been lame outside of the presence and temple of the living God inside and walking around and leaping for joy all because we remember who we are his people in his power being his presence in the world remembering that we are missionaries well the Muppets take Manhattan does have a resolution Kermit's running around forgetting who he is. Hardened advertisement executive. And Miss Piggy, the love interest, finally gets so frustrated. She karate chops Kermit across the room. He hits his head on the wall. And he's brought back to himself. He's brought back to his senses. And he returns to the work before him. The show goes on. The world and the cosmos is saved because the Broadway show opens. Friends, each and every week in word and sacrament, we are brought back to our senses. Every week in this place, as we rehearse this meal, this story of our salvation, we are jogged back to our senses and we remember who we are. By the grace of God, you are who you are and the grace to you is not in vain. What do we say after communion each week? We thank the Father for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are the living members of the body of Christ. His people in his power to be his presence to a world that needs Jesus. It's World Mission Sunday. So where are God's missionaries today? Kermit, do you remember yourself today? You are who God has made you to be. The missionaries of God are right here. So let us in the power of the spirit, in the confidence that his word brings us, in the nourishment which we are about to receive at this table, let us return 
for the lives that God has won for us. And let us be in this generation who Jesus has made us to be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.